to another episode of Seeking Voices of Health, Healing, and Hope. I'm your host, Dr. Monica Agarwal. As you know, I'm a preventive cardiologist who focuses on nutrition and lifestyle to improve and decrease chronic illness. I myself have a advanced form of rheumatoid arthritis, which I on a daily basis work on improving slowly, tinkering here and there. I like to bring people onto this show because I want to bring them messages of hope uh, and messages of joy and and laughter and and comfort in knowing that there are people out there that are like them, that are going through illness, that are trying to recover and that are overcoming. So today I have a really special guest and I have Dr. Michael Clapper here uh, to have to talk with us today. Dr. Clapper is a medical doctor and he's a graduate of the University of Illinois. Um, he did a load of acute care medicine and then shifted over to working on promoting uh, healthy foods and lifestyle to prevent and reverse heart disease. And I'm sorry, not just heart disease, I'm so biased, uh, prevent and reverse disease. He has a great voice because he's been a radio host, he was a pilot, he helps, uh, he's been a nutrition advisor to NASA. Um, for the, the space um, the space team, which is so cool. Most neat what is, is what he's doing right now. He's been working um, with medical students to improve uh, nutrition and lifestyle education for medical students, which I look forward to hearing about. He has an, a, a vibrant uh, telemedicine practice uh, and uh, just so many other cool things that we're gonna talk about it. Thanks so much, Dr. Clapper, for being on the show. Oh, you're so welcome. It's so great to be with you. I'm such an admirer of your work. It's, it's, an, it's an honor to be with you and your audience. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I, I tell people that the goal of this podcast wasn't really to talk about anything in particular in terms of nutrition, or, but it was just to sort of talk about how to motivate and how to get excited and how to bring joy. And so I found that maybe myself, I was looking for a way to find, I was looking for joy and comfort in other people's stories and in other people's maybe learning about their obstacles and overcoming them has helped me as well as a doctor and as a patient myself and sort of hoping that that is what this um, podcast does. So what I would love to start is with is just maybe you telling us a little bit about your journey. Like, how did this start for you? And I, I find that to be an interesting question because you're a medical doctor. You trained the way I trained. You went through all the hoops that we all did, studied forever. And then, like, how did you become this guy who's now known as the nutrition and lifestyle guy? Uh, good question. Let's see if I can uh, give you the, uh, the capsule version of it. Uh, as you mentioned, I have the same uh, Western medical training you did, and I graduated uh, in 1972, good heavens, 50 years ago. And I thought I was going to be doing blood and guts medicine for all my uh, career. And for the first seven years, that's just what I did, emergency rooms, operating rooms, urgent care clinics, et cetera. Uh, and I was in general practice. Uh, and I got so frustrated after six years of watching my patients just getting uh, fatter and sicker and having their strokes and their heart attacks. And I felt so impotent. I didn't know really what to tell them. You ought to lose some weight, Joe. But I, I really didn't know what to tell them. I got so frustrated. I left general practice and uh, went off to become an anesthesiologist. And I did uh, three years as an anesthesia resident. And I started getting some messages uh, during my uh, third year of training. I was on the cardiovascular anesthesia service and in Vancouver. And uh, day after day, I'm putting people to sleep and I'm watching surgeons open their chest and open their coronary arteries and pulling this yellow guck out of their arteries called atherosclerosis that you know well. And uh, there are already studies in the book showing that this is largely the fat of the animals these people are eating and that you can melt this away with a whole food plant-based diet. And I had great interest in this because my dad died of clogged arteries. He was already showing signs of angina back then. And I knew if I didn't change my diet, I was going to be on that operating table with that striker saw going up my sternum. And I sure didn't want that. I saw those folks when they woke up in recovery. They were very uncomfortable. And so my left brain was telling me, clean up your diet before you wind up like your dad. Uh, but also, um, uh, another sphere altogether was sending me messages. I, 
I had spent a lot of my fourth year in medical school. Uh, my Saturday nights, I would, uh, a little perverse, but I, instead of dating girls, I spent my Saturday nights in the trauma unit at, at Big Ben Old Cook County Hospital in Chicago. Ooh. And uh, boy, I saw the worst of what human beings do to each other uh, after a night of that. I had to sit down and compose myself. I uh, was shaking inside. And I vowed that if I, I saw what an evil um, violence is as a solution to human problems. And I said, if, if I can't get the cure the world of its violence, at least I want to get out of my own life and become a truly nonviolent person. And so I started reading books by the Indian saints, by Satchitananda and Mahatma Gandhi, about living a life of nonviolence, of ahimsa. And it really resonated with me. And, and I saw the word vegetarian go by. Yes, right, they're, they're, they're those Indians, they, they do that. Uh, but somehow I'm a you know, hot uh, Western trained guy in the 70s there. They're not quite for me. Uh, and um, so uh, as I'm in my anesthesia residency, I'm out one night with another resident at a restaurant for dinner. And I'm pontificating about living a life of nonviolence while I'm polishing off a porterhouse steak at the local keg and cleaver. And uh, he looks at me and says, that, that's all very nice, Michael, but if you want to get rid of the violence in your life, you might want to start with that piece of meat on your plate uh, because in satisfying your desire for the taste of flesh in your mouth, you are paying for the death of the animal and for the next one in line at the slaughterhouse. And uh, I, as soon as he said that, all the old rationalizations jumped into my head, well, the animal's dead already, and that's what they raised them for. Uh, but I had done a lot of my growing up on my uncle's dairy farm in Wisconsin when I was a kid, and I saw the violence inherent in putting any piece of meat on the table. I chopped the heads off chickens. I saw the old dairy cow shot in the head. It's, it's, a, it's a violent act to be creating meat and, and paying for it. And um, so before I could get any of these objections out, a little voice on my shoulder said, you know, he's right. He's right. I mean, that's incredible. 35 years ago, somebody's telling you this, that a, you, your friends already that you'd picked at that time were already a, already a little bit like you, weren't they? they? Or a little bit of the way you wanted to be. Indeed, but you know, you had another anesthesia resident who's quick to pick out hypocrisy there. You know, I mean, we're both eating steak there, but he he was right on, you know, and uh, and so we lovingly pointed that out. And when I went up to pay for the steak dinner, I felt complicit in a crime because I love cows. I, I milk them. I know the big beautiful eyes, and and I knew what I had been paying for, and um, so that was the end of my meat eating, and. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah. So you stopped eating meat back then. Just oh, like yeah. That. that was 1981. And uh, the curtain came down on meat eating. And it couldn't, you know, the animals were always looking, you know, like, you know, who am I kidding here? And, uh, and so if you want the complete story, the... Um, uh, a few weeks later, I'm getting dressed to go to the hospital and I'm putting my leather wallet in my pocket and putting on my leather belt. And um, I had been raised in a Jewish household after World War II. And I had seen the pictures of the lampshades made out of the skins of the Jews. And, and here I am putting on the skins of these animals on my feet and in my pocket. And it felt absolutely cadaverous. And, and I just couldn't do that. And uh, and so I stopped eating them. I got to stop wearing them. And I went out in the backyard and I dug a hole and I put my leather shoes, my leather belt, my leather wallet in there uh, after taking the money out and, uh, <laughs> and buried, buried them. I stepped back, apologized to the animals. If you don't know, you don't know. Lovely. But, but once you know, you, you kind of have an obligation to be have some integrity there. And so and began the, the era of hemp wallets and non-leather belts, et cetera. And a couple of weeks later, I'm re relating to a friend what, uh, what my evolution I had gone through. And she says, oh, you've become a vegan. And uh, I had never heard the word, but uh, OK, I guess I did. I looked it up. Yep, I guess I have. And um, well, not only did it feel better when I laid my head down at night knowing I hadn't paid for the death of any animals, my body loved it. My, a, within 12 weeks, a, a 20 pound spare tire of fat melted off my waist. My high blood pressure came to normal. My high cholesterol went to normal. I felt great waking up in a nice lean body. 
And, uh, and at that point, I knew I didn't want to be an anesthesiologist and spend my life putting people to sleep, literally. I'd rather go back to general practice and help them wake up, right? And so, um, and so I did, much to my parents' dismay, uh, six months to go in my anesthesia residency. I said, this is not the life I want to live. And um, said, do you know the money you are getting you are <laughs> for going here? But uh, it just is not, it was not in truth any longer. I, I have such reverence for my brethren in anesthesia, thank God for them, but uh, it was not the career for me. I went back to general practice and found some people um, who gave cooking lessons in the neighborhood and uh, plant-based cooking lessons. And, uh, and the patients who were, who were open to the idea, I would send them to learn how to eat plant-based. And it didn't take long before not only they were losing weight and feeling better, but I'm getting these calls from my patients with high blood pressure that, uh, Doc, I stood up and I got a light head. I thought I was going to pass out. And they, and they were on three medicines for their blood pressure. And I said, yeah, I cut them in half. And then the, a couple of weeks later, they, it's still happening, Doc. And I said those faithful words, stop your blood pressure pills. You know, he says, I'm, I'm getting up. I got 90 over 60 for pressure. And I said, you know, you don't have the disease of hypertension any longer. Stop your blood pressure pill. Well, when I said those words, I thought there'd be a puff of smoke and the ghost of my internal medicine professor would appear saying, what did you say? Stop this <laughs> blood pressure, man. Nobody had this lifetime medication. Nobody gets off blood pressure. But the man no longer had high blood pressure. And not only can you get them off the blood pressure, you have to get them off. They'll stand up and pass out on you. And um, so medicine started getting interesting. And then I'm getting calls from my diabetic patients on 30 units of insulin. So now my blood pressure is going, my blood sugar is going down to 40 and 50. And so I cut your insulin in half and cut it in half again. And finally, I said those words, stop your insulin. You don't have diabetes anymore, type two at least. And again, I looked for the, the puff of smoke, but it never, never appeared there. And uh, suddenly medicine started becoming really fun. I'm, I'm watching this phenomenon of, called, of these people reversing their diseases. Nobody in med school told me these are reversible diseases, but they are, they're evidently reversible. Yeah. And so uh, I've become the happiest doctor I know, helping people get healthier on plant-based diets and lifestyle improvements. And so that's been the last uh, for almost 40 years of my medical practice. And uh, so that's how I became sitting here. We, we still have the, the education side of it, but that's yeah. basically the nut of my, uh, of my uh, personal evolution. But that's so lovely, you know, and so interesting. So it started out for you as nonviolence to animals and then sort of moved and evolved into, well, gosh, I shouldn't even eat animals. And then I maybe actually it makes people better, which is such a nice evolution. Did you feel like, how did you, was it hard? Was it hard to stop eating animals? And was it hard? Like, how, tell me about the, the, the process in your head of saying, I'm not going to eat any animals. Was it gradual? Was it just like this? Oh, good for you. Um, yeah. Yes. How did you motivate yourself to keep going? Very good question. Um, and it was not easy. I had meat cravings for years. Uh, and, and I did go back to, uh, to eating fish for a while to see if I would, may, may, I would have any, if I could feel anything in my body. I didn't, but I, I clearly still had a craving for it. It eventually faded away. Um, the red meat was easy. <laughs> I was uh, in a supermarket. And uh, looking at the meat in the case, um, and uh, big steaks there, and and because it's the section of the upper leg of a bovine animal with basically the same anatomy we have, I much to my horror, I could uh, I could name all the muscles uh, in that steak there. There's rectus femoris and adductor magnus, and uh, and you know it became so evident what it was there um, that it really uh, put me Shook off. You. Plus. What, what the animal really, you know, really has to go through. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so there came a point, uh, I have a little fish regression there, that it just, my body just shifted metabolic gears. It just wasn't a, an issue. Plus I was, I really get to like the taste and textures of, of, of 
plant-based foods there are the curries and the chilies and the lasagnas and the, the my my tongue was having a wonderful time and um, and the beauty you can eat you know, whether you go back for a third bowl of vegetable soup who cares it's all fiber and water it doesn't stick to you it's guilt-free eating and so uh, the more i enjoyed the textures and taste and the, and the freedom of it the, the and and when I, after I read John Robbins' book on diet for new Americans, see what it's doing to the planet. I, I can't just do it. I can't do it to the animals anymore. I can't do it to the kids anymore. It's their world uh, all the way around. It's not an issue any longer at this point. And, and when I walk past the barbecue, and, and, uh, apologies to your audience there, but it, it smells like burning flesh in there. It's, it's yeah. the truth of it. And it's just no longer appetizing. So I, it's, I it's, think it's, so, it's easy. Go ahead. I think that's great. So I like people to hear somebody like you, you know, who's been doing it for so many years, who's been eating plant-based for so many years to sort of go through some of that process, because it is, it is harder for some people to make the change and to move. And, and for many people, or maybe for all of us to make change and, and to point out that maybe it doesn't have to be all at once, but that you slowly, you know, you build up in a little bit more each day and a little bit, and, and, and many of us have fallen back into sort of bad habits, but it's okay. And it's not about sort of getting mad at yourself for what you did wrong, but sort of moving, how am I going to do better tomorrow? And then evolving and getting better and better each day. And I, I think that sometimes people look at you or maybe me and sort of say, well, you know, God, how did they do it? And I just can't. Well, I, I just think it's important for everybody here that maybe that it was hard for all of us and that it's just we're further along on the path. But uh, that doesn't mean that it wasn't hard or, or that we didn't struggle or that we didn't have meat cravings or but it just becomes this process where maybe the uh, the mind became stronger and it said, you know what, I don't I don't want to hurt animals. I want to feel great, and this is going to take priority uh, over whatever maybe immediate gratification I was having from eating those animal products. And I, I think that that's important and to and to sort of acknowledge that it's not it's okay if it's if it's hard. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't mean that it's not worth it. Absolutely. I mean, uh, when people say, where do these meat cravings come from? And uh, the people who feel better when they eat meat, uh, I say, you know, it's not your fault, really. It's nobody's fault. But uh, in our society, in our affluent society, at age six months of age, while the baby's still nursing on the breast, with all the love in the parents' hearts, they just want the best nourishment for their child. Um, and they, that's what they're told to do, that, that, that jar of baby chicken is open and baby lamb and baby turkey. And from six months of age on, three times a day, animal muscle gets slathered on this child's intestine all through infancy and then childhood and their uh, adolescence and their teen, puberty and teen years and 20s and 30s. You eat animal flesh three times a day for 30 years. Um, your body is going to get used to that preformed carnitine, creatine, myelin, all those muscle related nutrients flooding through your tissues on a constant basis. And, and we can make these ourselves, we can make all the carnitine, creatine, all that, whatever we need. But if it's coming in preformed constantly, the odds are, especially in your childhood, your own genes to make these substances going to down regulate so you don't make too much of it. Well, that's great as long as it's continuing to come in and most people eat meat three times a day, but then you go vegan and suddenly all that preformed muscle nutrient gone. Now you got to make your own, all of it now. Most people can gear up their enzymes and their genetics to, to, to do that, but there's a significant population, 10, 20, 30% may take them six months, 12 months, a year, whatever. And during that time, they draw down on their own stores of these nutrients and don't feel so great. And they eat some meat and, and these preformed nutrients flood through their tissues. Da -da, I feel better. And so ah, I'm a you know, vegan schmegan, I'm a carnivore. But what do we really, this is not normal human physiology. What are we looking at? This is an acquired dependency created by feeding a human infant animal flesh three times a day since infancy. But you raise a child as a vegan, and I've seen a number, two generations of them grow up. You raise them on a plant-based diet. They're lean, healthy folks. They don't get meat cravings. 
They'll never become obese. They'll never clog their arteries. They'll never develop type two diabetes. It's a gift beyond measure to raise a child on a plant-based diet. So those folks who say, I can't do this. I get meat craving. Get, as Dr. Argerwal says, give yourself time. Even if you have to meet, eat it once a week for medicinally for a, for a few months or years, it's fine. It's better than three times a day. And yeah. to slowly stretch out the interval between, and eventually it fades out of your diet there, but don't beat yourself up. And again, it wasn't your fault, nobody's fault, who knew? You know, your mother didn't know, my mother didn't know, it's okay. Uh, do the best you can, as Dr. Agarwal says. No, I love that. I think so many, a couple of important points you bring up. And one of those is that sadly, um, when you bring up children, I always like to point out to people that if you, there are studies that show that children who die of leukemia at age six and people who died at 18 and 20 um, in Vietnam and Korea, they, if you look at their blood vessels, they already have fatty streaks for those children and they already have plaque in their heart at 18 and 20 years old. So remember plaque is the start of heart disease. And so um, I do think that, you know, even though we think that this is something normal to give children meat and animal products as kids, that is not healthy. Uh, it just because it's sort of what we do in America, um, most many parts of the world uh, and um, people don't eat any meat at all, right? And in fact, my culture as an Indian, uh, they don't eat meat. Uh, in fact, when, I'm, when my parents, uh, when I was um, about seven or eight years old, my parents, we lived in America and I was born here and my mom and dad were concerned about my not fitting in. So they just said that I thought they, they thought I should eat meat uh, and so they took me to McDonald's because they didn't know where to go. And so they took me to McDonald's and said, well, you know, you have to fit into this culture and they eat meat here. So we should eat meat too. And they never ate meat, but they introduced it to us, interestingly. Uh, and I ate animal products from about age eight to age 16 and then stopped uh, eating animal products. But I do think that, um, I think it is interesting that we have this perception as parents that we should feed our children these foods because they are healthy for us or it's because that's how they were raised. And I love that you reminded people that you've raised your children or you raised, you've seen generations of plant-based people. I raised my own children plant-based. Uh, and I will tell you, it's very interesting. Um, when my kids were little, um, when they would go to a birthday party, they would eat chicken fingers and I would say nothing. I would say absolutely nothing. I raised them the way I raised them. And if they wanted to go out and eat whatever they want, they would eat them. And, um, it's very interesting in the last, now my kids are 11, 13 and 15. I can't believe it. Um, it. it's a little older since when you saw them at my house. Um, and so when they identify and they talk to people, they say, well, they don't eat animal products. They don't eat meat on their own. In the last three or four years, they have gone completely plant-based. I mean, they were always plant-based at home, but once in a while they'd have whatever they eat, but now they specifically reach out and they tell people and their kids and seventh graders, or she's talking, my daughter's telling people she doesn't eat animal products because they're not good for you. And she doesn't eat animal products because they're not, why would I hurt another animal? And it's just, it makes me so proud to hear that and to see that evolution that they've, they've sort of come to that on their own. And um, so it's just sort of neat, uh, but it's such an important thing. So if you were trying to tell people and you were trying to guide people who some guy comes off the street, not a, not a believer, somebody who, you know, believers come see you all the time and see me all the time. And those are almost easier patients to work with because they already come knowing that plant-based nutrition is where they want to go. They just need some help. But what about if I, you saw the guy who is the deer hunter or doesn't want to change, what would be some of the things, what would be three things that you would ask them, but they're sick. Let's just say this is the deer hunter who's sick. What would be three things you'd ask them to change in their life? Oh my, <laughs> I was going to ask you the same question. How you handle your patients there? Well, that, that's a, we'll save that for another day. Yeah. But it, it, is, it is the question. And you know, as you and I are both doing lifestyle medicine and you're confronted with one of these disease producing lifestyles. And again, he's innocent too. That's how his father raised him. And uh, he, does, he doesn't know. Uh, so how do you begin to find a chink in the fortress there just to pry open and, uh, and, and appeal to him? So um, first of all, he's another human being on his own journey. And you don't, count, don't judge anybody, don't count them out. You never know 
I've had guys like this, and five years later, they're head of their president of the local vegan society. And you and say, awesome, right? It's you amazing. Say, I know. Amazing. You know? So, know, so don't count anybody out, you know, but but how do you start there? Yeah, how do you uh, start? A couple of things, right. So a couple of things. Um, one, he's a human being, make a connection. What, what is he like? What gives him joy? Uh, what's uh, What does he do for a living? You know, what, uh, uh, just find out, you know, who's in there and, uh, and make, make a, a positive connection with them. Uh, and then he's sitting in front of me as the physician, uh, whatever the issue that he's got, if it's that chest pain when he was walking up the hill, uh, stalking a deer there, um, if it's his leg, his right leg is starting to turn cold and blew out, whatever brought him to, to be sitting in front of me with a medical problem. Um, I'm a natural born teacher, so and I've got lots of great pictures. So I'll turn on my laptop and turn it around and I'll bring up pictures of what his issue really is. I show him what happened. I say, you know, take me through a typical eating day. What do you really eat? I know every doctor should ask every new patient that question. Take me through an eating day. What do you really eat? Yeah, what's for breakfast? What's for snack? Abs what's for drinking? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, and shut up, doctor, and listen to what the man's telling you, because that's why he's sitting in front of you, more is likely. And so, so, you know, the glory of the whole standard American diet usually lays itself out there. And we talk about specifics of, of what the, the fats in the, in the meat and the cheese actually do uh, and, and how it causes his specific symptoms. He's a guy, he probably likes mechanical explanations for why this does that. And so I'm glad to meet him on that level. And, um, and then I show him pictures of uh, the before and after folks who've adopted plant-based diets, who've unclogged their arteries, who've got rid of their, uh, melted away their plaques and, and uh, overcame their angina. And I give him a hopeful vision. Uh, and then finally, I say, uh, to, um, uh, well, let's talk about foods that we can make healthy, a healthy version of, of you know, let's, what do you have for breakfast? And we, we, we get oatmeal, fruit, uh, whatever. Uh, how about oat milk? Oh, they make no kind of oats. Yes. And I've got to bring up pictures of, uh, of these from various products. And then lunches and dinners, you know, if we negotiate on vegetables, there's a, everybody should have a big salad every day. I know you're a big fan of that. Uh, and, um, and, you know, the thought of having a big salad for lunch, you know, open up a can of chickpeas or beans and dump it on the cell. Man, that's a meal that can get you through the whole afternoon. And they never thought of that. And uh, to, to, to open up this world of great eating to them uh, is, just, is a gift and a half. Uh, and then um, I will give them some, I will say, I have a handout with, with video. You need to have forks over knives. What the hell? You know, watch these videos, and I want to see you back here next week. And I want to talk to you about them, yeah, and, and and note his weight, and uh, just say you know be really positive. You can do this, and the food is great. You're gonna love it, and uh, and you're going to get healthier here. Yeah. You know, I don't want to stand. You don't you don't need to stand right now. You know, you could, let's have a really honest shot. You know, step time later if we need it, but right now let's see if we can healthy up. Not only your arteries, but your whole body is going to get healthier. And I just ask him to make this one step or two, and, and, I'll, and but follow up if he knows he's going to be sitting in front of me in a week. That is highly motivating. And there's nothing like a phone call from the doctor in the middle of the week. How are you doing? Uh, and how's it going? The doctor called me. You know that that's really important. So uh, it comes down to uh, someone says the the way to care for patients is to care for patients. You know, and if they know that you care. Um, they, they respond. This one, of the, one of the few human beings in their lives probably carry these days. So uh, we use that to its full advantage. I love that. I, I think that um, I think that meeting people where they are um, is one of those third things that comes from this, and sort of being able to understand um, who they are. I think that was lovely to say that because so many people we don't know how they've started, what you know, how their situation is, and. And, and for us to come in as sort of, look, this is the only way to do it, bottom line, that is not effective, right? And it, it's the learning about the person and, and affecting change in a very positive, supportive way. I think that's so important. I'm glad you said that. Um, so tell me how you're working with medical students. Like, how does that, how did that come about? And, and where did you start this sort of medicine capsule and moving medicine forward initiative? And you know, how did that start and, and uh, what are you doing with that? 
Sure, thank you. Uh, well, as you, doctor, know very well, um, there is this gaping black hole in medical education called nutrition as far as what your patients are eating, doctor, and how it's affecting these diseases. Now, we never mentioned that. I mean, we just blow right past it in medical education. We're so busy cramming our heads full of physical diagnosis and pathology that, um, that the patient's diet, ah, it doesn't matter. Let them eat what they want to eat. Uh, it's okay. That's never been shown, never in any studies that it makes any difference. Uh, and, you know, this impervious shell is built up in medical education when nutrition gets short shrift on, you know, the, how to diagnose and treat scurvy. You know, that's our nutrition education. Uh, but the truth is that uh, diet is so important. It is the square one when it comes to both creating disease in organs throughout the body, as well as reversing those diseases. Uh, we are plant-eating hominids, basically. We've got basically the same digestive system that our gorilla and bonobo cousins have, and they're up in the trees eating leaves and fruit, and they don't develop clogged arteries, and they don't develop type 2 diabetes, and they pass these big soft stools a couple times a day. They don't develop colitis. And the closer we can get to honoring that plant-based diet in our own bodies, the healthier we're going to be. And... Um, and uh, when I, uh, my colleagues, uh, my contemporaries, my age, um, they, they don't know that it's a different language to them. But I realized, why didn't someone tell me this in med school? Well, we need to reach the medical students. If someone had said these are reversible diseases and a plant-based diet is the key to that, that would have changed everything I saw in medical school. It would have changed the, uh, every diagnosis I made, every treatment plan I recommended. Um, what, uh, as the German philosopher Goethe said, what you know about, you see. Once you know about something, you start seeing it everywhere. And uh, <clears throat> so I really, let's get to the med students. Um, the, let's start there. I, uh, let's change their, uh, their understanding. So um, uh, before COVID, I was going around to the nation's med schools, giving a lecture, what I wish I learned in medical school about nutrition. And I yeah, you to, came to University of Florida. It was uh, I it was came really to the University fun. of Florida. You, get, you, were host, you were kind enough to host me there. Yeah. Uh, and here's what a fast food meal does to your bloodstream. And here's what those changes do to your various organs. You need to know this. And um, <laughs> many of the students are eating the same stuff themselves too. And... Um, so uh, then along comes COVID. I, gave, I was given that talk to about 25 different medical schools and I was enjoying it, but along comes COVID. Nobody gathers 100 people in a lecture hall anymore. Uh, and so we switched online and I've now been reaching more med students than ever uh, as part of our Moving Medicine Forward initiative, uh, giving this lecture by Zoom. And, um, and uh, people are, willing, are welcome to go to my website, drclapper.com, and uh, click on Moving Medicine Forward. You'll see the work that we're doing and how you can support it if you'd like. Uh, but you can watch the video there. And thanks to people's donations, uh, <clears throat> we uh, have been able to hire our, our program director, coordinator, um, uh, Heather Borders, who's a registered dietitian, uh, and um, because just for me giving a one-time drive-by lecture, you know, they get all excited for a few weeks, and then it fades away in the, in the, in the flood of uh, medical school education there. So Heather is going to contact the student who, who brought me in for the lecture, and so what do you need to keep the fire going here? Do you need a Q&A with Dr. Clapper every month? Do you need, uh, you want to do a plant-based journal club? You want to talk about clinical cases? You want a guest speaker? You want Dean Orange to come in? Whatever you need. You want to show films and talk about it. Whatever you need to, to get plant, to get the concept of disease reversal through plant-based nutrition. Is, is a thing that, you know, in people's head, like the microbiome has become a thing and people know about it now. Oh yes, you can reverse disease through plant-based nutrition. I want those words coming out of the lips of the medical students. And we're going to give them studies uh, showing uh, how plant-based nutrition can, is the key to these disease reversals and questions to ask their professors when you're in diabetes clinic. Doctor, do you think this patient's diet had anything to do with 
clogging up their insulin receptors, when you're in vascular or hypertensive clinic. Here's some questions to ask your professors about uh, the patient's diet and to get people talking about it. So after a while, it becomes accepted. You know, it's, of course, you know, uh, antibiotics affect the microbiome. We know that now. Well, plant-based nutrition can reverse diseases. I want that second nature in, in the medical student's uh, awareness. So that's what our, we're doing with our plant-based nutrition, uh, with our um, Moving with Medicine, our Moving Medicine Forward. Forward initiative. And uh, again, I invite people to learn about it. And, and, uh, and, if, and on the website, uh, there's a space that if you have, a, if you know a medical student who you think would be interested in this, you know someone who's a faculty member at some med school who is open to this, uh, have them contact us and, and they can become our liaison at the medical school, Heather will get in touch with them. So it's an exciting era. In a way, you know, as you in preventive cardiology, yeah, uh, you shouldn't have to be doing this. I shouldn't have to be doing this, really. Uh, we, we should both be out hiking and, uh, and watching birds here. But, but, but the, it's a matter of education at this point. Doctor means teacher, you know, and that's, that's our highest roles. And okay. so, uh, so we're trying to put ourselves out of business here. But in doing so, we're uh, getting this word out. No, I love it. I mean, I think it's really important. A couple of things you said that I, I want to highlight are, you know, that medical, if you teach a student uh, and you teach a medical student, then you've got doctors, you've got the whole, and doctors then teach their patients. Um, I often tell people I like to, to work with women and moms, because if I get the mom, I get the household. Um, and so same thing with students. So working with medical students is really important. And just uh, not just medical students, it's PA students and other allied professionals. And I often work, like to work with nurses, because if you work with nurses, they're the ones who are directly in contact with the patients every day. And, and after we introduced the plant-based menu at University of Florida, it was they, them who had to talk to the patients and say, actually, you should try this. We tried this, this tofu stir fry or, or this uh, hummus wrap or this meal was really good. You should try it and um, see if you like it, you know? And so I, I really like working with the nurses too. So I think, I think that that's key is, is teaching the next generation of doctors and kids and and getting moms who will then teach their kids and doctors who will then teach their patients is really important. So I applaud the initiative. And, and a lot of medical schools now have these lifestyle interest groups um, that are out there that are um, that should reach out to you and contact you so that they can get um, maybe ha have you do a talk for them or, you know, to try to help and motivate um, other people in the schools. And that's certainly important. So reaching out on drclapper.com and, and move to the Moving Medicine Forward, I think is such a great, um, a great initiative. So I'm glad you're doing that. You know, Mike, I really have enjoyed knowing you and getting to uh, just seeing your work over the years. Uh, and what I, I love about you is that you're kind uh, and that you're not um, you're not proud. Um, you you appreciate be, the humility of the illness and understand that um, people are where they are. And I don't think that everybody's like that. And I think that um, many doctors, we unfortunately come off and say it's this way or no way. Um, and if you don't respond, they don't want to work with you. And I think what I admire and appreciate so much about you is that you really do understand that people, um, we all have our own circumstances and we're all doing the best we can. And I think that that's really important that you focus on that. And I think it brings people into your world better um, because people want to meet a person where they don't feel judged. And I think that that's the key. Uh, I think that's the key to being a good teacher and being a good doctor um, is sort of being able to not judge and just you know meet people where they are. So I, I applaud that. I love what you're doing. And I love that no matter what time you've done, you've worn so many hats in your life, but you continue to evolve and grow and not be afraid to challenge yourself by saying, you know what, I'm going to work with medical students now and they may not love me or they may fight me, but I'm going to do that now. And I think that that's great. And I think um, not everybody will go out there and throw themselves out there like that. And I, I just, I want to honor those things that you do, which are so important. And so you know, I just want to thank you for coming on and telling us about what you're doing. Tell us a little bit about your story, telling us about moving medicine forward, all important initiatives and um, just proud to know you and, um, and excited about the work you're doing. 
Well, thank you, Monica. It's definitely a mutual admiration society. Your, your book, Body on Fire, taught me so much, uh, even at this stage. And uh, you're a superb teacher, a wonderful physician, and a really exemplar of a woman. And, uh, oh. and I'm proud to call you a, a, my friend as well as a colleague. So yeah, thank you so for the opportunity to connect with you. All kind, the best to you. You're kind. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure. And if you guys have questions for Dr. Clapper, please reach out on the podcast uh, forum for, uh, and we'll answer, uh, we'll try to get those questions to Dr. Clapper. All right. Thanks Thank guys. Bye-bye.